Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick here for this week's One Last Thing with co-host Slava Cooperstein. Slava, how are you doing? Doing well, Ken. How about yourself? Uh, well, I've been better health-wise, but but hopefully going to get there in time for Saturday because it's certainly a big weekend for Baltimore sports. Uh, this uh, week, uh, always prepping for Steelers week, is usually the biggest story of the year. Obviously, with the Orioles going, it's not so much. With us looking back at the Browns and bask in the afterglow of, a, of an enormous win on the road. Uh, it, it might not might be somewhat muted by that as well. And the Steelers, of course, not the team they once were, still, I think, very dangerous defensively, but with a lot of offensive holes, including uh, missing their number one receiver, Deontay Johnson. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you can never take Steelers week for granted. They've played Lamar, you know, pretty well uh, every time that uh, he's been around to play them. And, uh, you know, it's it's a real opportunity to go three and oh on the road in the division. Um, so it's a, it's an important week. And um, and so, you know, looking at, uh, you know, uh, this week, um, looking ahead to this week, Mike Tomlin was asked about a number of the uh, Steelers players or rather about a number of the Ravens players. And he had um, he had some some praise for a number of folks. He talked up Zay Flowers, um, and he also talked up uh, uh, our uh, inside linebackers, uh, Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, and really talked about uh, what challenge they present, um, which kind of coincided with, I I was already thinking about this uh, topic, about um, highlighting, you know, how important those two have been uh, to the really excellent defensive performance that we've gotten throughout the first four weeks of the season. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. I mean, top top to bottom, we'll get into the integration of the defense, I think, as we discuss through this. Um, I, on the Know Your Foe episode, uh, the guest, and, and by the way, I highly recommend people go and listen to that. It's a, it's a, always a good discussion with Alex Kazora, who brings tremendous detail uh, about what's happening with the, with the Steelers right now. But uh, he mentioned that uh, Patrick Queen, he thought, uh, had been in a spat with Tomlin, and he, he felt it a little unusual that Tomlin was saying nice things about him. But, uh, you know, I think Tomlin's just analyzing the game as he sees it, and he said some things about about Queen that were probably accurate, about Queen, um, you know, not playing well in some aspect of the game. You know, coverage has certainly been something that's been a problem. His tackling is another thing that he's not always been consistent with over the years. But Tomlin, nothing but nice things to say about Queen this week, uh, which surprised him slightly. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it just goes to show, I mean, obviously, you know, all of these media things, uh, y- y- you wonder how much of it is fluff and how much of it is, uh, you know, the coach just trying to get through it. But, you know, Tomlin doesn't uh, I, I, doesn't strike me as somebody who's going to really waste his time up, up there, uh, you yeah. know, just, just talking to players for no reason. So, you know, he had, he had a lot of good things to say about Patrick Queen, and I think that's reflective of the fact that, uh, since last year, Patrick Queen has basically improved on like an exponential level from where he was in his first few seasons. And, you know, uh, I think on the national media level, everybody talks about the arrival of Rokon Smith. And obviously that that's had a tremendous impact on, on Patrick Queen. But um, as you know, and a lot of other, other, other folks know, Patrick Queen had already uh, stepped up his game quite a bit uh, early on in the season. Um, in, the, in the few games uh, before the acquisition of Roquan Smith. Yeah, get, getting in position to make some interceptions, even though they didn't occur each time, is always nice to do. You want to you want to accumulate lottery tickets, and then eventually you get some interceptions out of it. And this is one of the nice things about the Ravens' defense. They're second in the entire National Football League with 25 passes defensed. They're not that high up in interceptions. They're uh, It's further down, maybe tied for seventh or something, tied for eighth might be. But either way, it, it's it's at a level where – um, they haven't been an astonishing interceptions per pass defense group. Of course, a lot of people don't know this, but interceptions are a subset of passes defense. So, and it's different at the college level, which confuses people that they count them different, count them separately. But at the pro level, as they're accounted for, interceptions are a pass defense. Um, and uh, you know, a, a, the normal ratio across the NFL is actually a little lower than it, than it has been in past years. But it's about one every six, or, or a little bit less. And the Ravens are one every six and a quarter. A, <clears throat> it's probably not nearly as high as you would expect 
for a zone defense that has eyes on the quarterback because a lot of passes defense occur at the line of scrimmage or at level two create result in a tip ball that might be intercepted and having eyes on the quarterback then and eyes on the football is going to provide you with lots of additional opportunity for interception. So each of those lottery tickets on those batted passes is going to be a, a, an increased probability of a win. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's something that the uh, the Ravens have not cashed in on. I don't think to the degree they can this year playing the sort of defense they are. And, and Roquan and Patrick Queen are each responsible for some really nice passes defense in there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, some of it is just a matter of, you know, a tip ball, you know, going a particular direction versus another, you know, that's, that's very random. And then obviously the Ravens with the quarterbacks that they've faced, as well as the, um, you know, cover two that they've been playing, haven't really been tested very deep. So they haven't really had those overthrow opportunities. Um, some of which have resulted in interceptions um, over the past few weeks. And, uh, you know, I expect that trend to continue um, if Kenny Pickett is the one playing. If Trubisky's playing and he, you know, fires some off deep, then, you know, I think we may have some opportunities. Okay. Well, we'll have uh, uh, the most recent uh, that I've heard is that, is that Pickett is more likely to go than not, but we'll see if that's the way it actually works out. Everybody, of course, thought last week, that it would be um, uh, Watson and not DTR going, and that didn't turn out to be the case. But let's get back to Queen and and um, Smith, if we can, for a minute. What, what do you think is special about their game? And maybe pick one thing, and then I'll kind of play off that or pick the next thing. Well, I, I, think, I think the overall thing that's really special about them is that they're both right now true three-down linebackers. They're, they're doing – uh, they're doing really everything well enough that you you're not being tipped off that one of them is going to be the designated pass rusher one of them is going to drop off into coverage if I had to, if I had to pick one thing that they're doing really well right now uh, particularly with Queen I would I would talk about uh, coverage because that was something that Queen really struggled with in his first um, first couple seasons uh, you know started to show some improvement last year but this year I mean, you know, he really doesn't appear to be a liability at all. Uh, certainly not um, to the extent that he was, where he was really the guy that was being picked on um, pretty significantly on third down um, throughout his earlier seasons. So, you know, it is fairly rare, and now we've almost taken it for granted at this point that that the uh, that teams are playing two three down players, and to have two to three down unicorns at the same time very unusual in in terms of guys you want. It's also Quite, quite risky in terms of injury. So I'm not really, you know, thrilled that you build the whole team around that. Hopefully nothing, you know, nothing happens to these guys. But it, the coverage is absolutely greatly improved. Even Roquan, I think he's having a better coverage year than he did last year. He's certainly had some tip balls, read the quarterback very well in zone. The responsibility placed on these linebackers with the Ravens' current zone defense is very high. And I'll tell you why. You start with a cover two shell. Now you can rotate out of that. You can match up zone. You could do, do whatever you know you might do in terms of scheming up an individual play coverage uh, from that. But almost always, those linebackers, if they're in coverage at all, have a significant responsibility of understanding route combinations behind them in level two, level three, while still being able to come quickly downhill to make plays if the ball gets swung out to a running back and maintaining that balance of the diagnosis of of where the ball may go short and also the ability to make a play on a ball between level two and level three has been something they balance very well. Roquan read the quarterback extremely well. He's got a couple tip balls. Uh, there's a, there's a great clip out there of Patrick queen taking a receiver off, uh, sorry, down the seam, dropping him off and immediately um, going to a crossing route from there and making it just a beautiful pass defense. And it was in a home game. I think it was from week. I think it was in week one, but it might have even been week week three against the Colts. Um, but a, but a great a great play, no doubt about it. In terms of of uh, of, of his PD, there he's looked good, so much better than he has. I think he's been more even on the diagnosis element. He's been very good at coming downhill and making tackles. And the responsibility of that group is it's it's focused and it's very high. And so far, they're completely holding up to the responsibility angles. Um, it'll be up to opposing defensive coordinators to figure out how to beat those two. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're absolutely reading and reacting 
you know, uh, every single time. And, and, and uh, you know, so often it looks like, uh, you know, Queen and, and Smith are, are just the two fastest guy on the field, uh, fastest guys on the field. They are explosive. They flow to the ball, you know, very quickly. And I think are a really big part of um, the team's tackling success and, and team defense. I mean, they're, they're, you know, tackling had been a problem for a number of years before um, Mike McDonald had gotten here. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's up to the players to execute. And, and that's another area, by the way, that Queen has improved tremendously this season. Yeah, much, much better tackler. And, and obviously it's one of his it, it is one of his biggest areas. He's had some non-form tackling this year, too. I want to I don't want to say everything is perfect, but but he's been a lot better than he than he uh, has been. I still hate to see him not, uh, you know, wrap up when he tackles and just go in with his pads. But uh, it's a it's a you know, it's something that that young players in in, in Often do you just don't expect it from linebackers who who are you know are taught to wrap up like nobody's business. Uh, one thing I want to make sure we talk about along this line, excuse me, <clears throat> is that the Ravens have one of the the tenets of their defense uh, throughout the the team's history, but also in, in terms of this year, one of the pillars that really built on is the ability to stop the run while they're in nickel. They played nickel almost all the snaps now. It's about 89.5% nickel of some sort with 9.4% base and only three snaps, uh, 1.1% of dime. Okay, there's dime have been some oddball and a half and a game plays. It's it's nothing that you wouldn't uh, not expect, but they've never leaned on the dime. And the reason for that is because of their committed nickel package, which having two inside linebackers on the field, you'd, you'd typically replace one of those two right. if you're going to put in a dime back. Or go to some weird dime like a thirty-two dime, which the Ravens have done before in their history, uh, it, it, to to get that six defensive back on the field. But anyway, the Ravens are, are a committed nickel team, so they've been, they've been doing it with five defensive backs the whole the whole time. So what is what does that mean? More, uh, it means that they need to be able to stop the run with a six man box. Now you can get a little help from safeties, but cover two safeties are about the least help you can possibly get against the run. They can't come up quickly enough to do much other than stop a play from going a long distance, um, it, which that's the job of a safety anyway. Uh, so that that the, the responsibilities for that go to the front six. And the front six have to be great space deniers on the inside who aren't selfish individual penetrating players necessarily, but you know, they're Michael Pierce and and, um, and uh, Brent Urban are great space deniers there, whereas Matabike is more of a, a more of a penetrator uh, great thing to be a pa- when, when you're a pass rusher, a little less valuable on, on, as a run defender. They also need to have great edge players, and the Ravens have built their their nickel run defense in, historically around great edge players, uh, particularly with Suggs, who was a generational talent at it. But they've had other guys too, you know, you know, uh, uh, going back to as far as Rob Burnett, but uh, including Jared Johnson yep. and Trevor Price and players like that who who, who could get it done there. Uh, and then you have, they've had great linebackers as a group, and and uh, this team is is no different. And that's probably the strongest group of the three levels this year. Um, and I think it's not really even that close um, of the of the three pairs that need to be good. It's it's Queen and Roquan who are doing the most to make sure that run game stays good. Yeah, definitely. And and I think the edge defenders um, with with regard to the run, I think it's been built a little bit on the fly with the acquisition. Of um of Clowney, um he, he's he's really been a steadying uh, force on the edge, and I think that the times really where um you know teams have had those big run plays have been when they've managed to bounce the outside. You know, Ojaba lost con- contain um, at least one time that I can think mm-hmm. of, but um you know the acquisition th- that yeah that's right um the acquisition of um, um Van Noy seems like it's going to uh, help in that respect as well. I mean, he has a pretty good reputation as a as uh, with setting the edge. So, um, you know, hopefully he will integrate in, uh, into the defense uh, just as well. Um, I, I know it was a small sample size last week, but. Oh, I, I thought, I thought he was fantastic last week. I mean, they, they, he was on the field for, and I, we're, we're both referring because we talked at our production meeting about his PFF grade, but he had a, a really lousy PFF grade against the run. And I, I don't agree with the grade. Let's just put it that way. And I, even after I've heard the explanation from PFF, and by the way, they're excellent, and they come get, get back to me when I have questions about why is that grade what it is. 
they said is based on two plays. One of the plays involved him getting a negative score on a on a play where he drew a holding penalty that negated an eight yard. Aaron Rodgers' season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie. NFL, college ball, and the brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit. Cash out early and place another bet or let it ride for a chance at a bigger payday. Join us at MyBookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boosts, same game parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you with fast, chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. If you're too busy this fall to cook but want to make sure you're eating well, then get Factor. This, guys, this is what I did. We were moving, packed up, packed up all my dishes, everything needed better meals. I signed up for Factor. It's best meals, probably the healthiest I've eaten in a month thanks to these Factor meals. Because with Factor, you can skip those extra trips to the grocery store and the chopping, the prepping, the cleanup, all while still getting flavor and the nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat, enjoy, and then get back to crushing your goals, which for me was trying to move. But now I can't. I need them for work at lunch every day. They're perfect. So this September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. So head to factormeals.com slash ravens50 and use that code ravens50 like I did to get 50% off. That's ravens50 at factormeals.com slash ravens50 to get 50% off your factor meals. Right. But they said, okay, but he also missed the tackle on that play. And because there was some explanation about because it was on the play side, it wasn't uh, it, 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 the holding was was opposite the play side or whatever, that, that he, he didn't get credit for the, uh, the drawing the hold in the same way. And I, I, whatever the case, I, I just I can't I can't buy it. I lost track of the argument because I, I was just hearing blah, blah, blah at that point. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, the, the, you know, if you want other evidence, Cleveland only rushed for eight yards on seven plays when Van Noy was in the game. That's fairly strong tonic to the run is by far the best of any, any uh, player on the Ravens in, in this last game. And Van Noy has a reputation as being a good run defender uh, throughout his career. In addition to an outstanding coverage linebacker, who's probably about the next best thing to Tyus Bowser in the entire league. Um, you know, a guy who can rush the passer a little bit, drop to coverage and be very effective for you. So um, I, I, I'm very confident in Van Noy's ability to, uh, uh, to defend, to help the Ravens maintain their run defense. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, all this boils down to we're playing really excellent uh, team defense and that's, you know, that you, you, you have to look at the players who allow the um, you know, I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Like, you know, just like Ray Lewis campaigned to draft a big defensive tackle and we got mm-hmm. Lodi Nada, you know, he, he's, he says, you know, this is going to let me be the best me. And the fact that we have these two inside linebackers who are the three down unicorns, as you say, you know, that allows us to, you know, stop the run with the six man box. But also, you know, the fact that we have um, Kyle Hamilton, you know, playing in the slot and he can quickly, you know, come up and contribute to the run defense, that, that also helps. It's all it's all symbiotic, but these guys are just doing a fantastic job. That's a, that's a great point, by the way, that Kyle Hamilton provides the Ravens with the most incredibly versatile nickel when he's positioned there because it's perfectly good against either 11 or 12 personnel, if you think about it. If the other team puts 12 on the field, and, and not 12 players, but 12 personnel, two tight ends, then one of them will almost certainly be flexed wide. But even if that's not the case, Kyle Hamilton's a good, you know, rangy tackler to have in there effectively as an extra edge defender. But they, they'll, 
if they split one, he's a perfect matchup coverage wise for, and he's always a good downhill uh, tackler in terms of what he can contribute there. So that could be one of the real keys to maintaining the success with the nickel um, uh, against the run is, is uh, moving Kyle Hamilton back there. And by the way, I'm, I'm predicting right now, I think that's going to happen this week with the return of Williams. I think we'll see. I think Stone has been too good to take off the field. I think Williams and Stone are the back end and Hamilton's back at nickel. And that's apologies to Arthur Mollette, who played great there in his uh, time. And hopefully nobody else gets hurt. And as hopeful as we are about that, we know it's going to happen. At some point, somebody's going to get hurt and Mollett's going to get playing time probably again. But uh, boy, did he have a great game uh, this last week at Cleveland. Yeah, he sure did. It's, it's, it, I, I, I don't know when the last time you, you could just say, oh boy, we're all of a sudden really, really deep in the uh, uh, secondary um, after thinking that that was going to be uh, you know, the, the problem child of this defense, um, yeah. you know, uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's a pretty, pretty good problem to have. Um, and, um, you know, just thinking about the inside linebackers, I, I, I wondered aloud to myself, like, when is the last time that the Baltimore Ravens fielded two inside linebackers of this, of this quality where, I mean, the key, the key thing is both inside linebackers have to be, two players that really aren't going to be coming off the field, um, um, uh, you know, because of their, you know, limitations. And I think you have to go all the way back to uh, 2008 when the Ravens had, you know, Ray Lewis and Bart Scott. And, you know, I mean, you know, after that time, Ray Lewis had a bunch of dance partners, but I don't think any of them was as, uh, as versatile as Bart Scott. And then you had the CJ Mosley years. And I think a lot of the players that he played next to were, uh, were inferior. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make another nomination. Let's do it that way. Sure. I think that the Mosley and Zach Orr unit was terrific, and and they almost played no dime in the first five years of the Dean Pease era. So between 2012 and 2016, uh, some of which was Orr, and and it was other people like Smith and Orr together, uh, and then it finally in 2014, I guess when Mosley was drafted, and then it became Mosley and Orr. Um, they they really did not play dime. They didn't bring a, a six defensive back on the field until Mosley got hurt at one point, and then they were kind of forced into it. <clears throat> so uh, that that unit was also great. Bart Scott, by the way, did come off the field. Is is something people don't really remember about that 2018. They played some dime, and they uh, uh, they had Bart come off the field. But Bart was an incredible player, that's for sure. And whether it's 06 or 08. Uh, whether it's him, uh, you know, making contributions as a pass rusher in run defense, doing all those things that that that, that made him so special, uh, you know, he was a, he was a great uh, a, a great pairing. That was a great pairing at linebacker. Yeah, uh, you know, he, he had a couple low lights in 07, but uh, yeah. but that didn't have to do with his play on the field. Um, <laughs> uh, the flag in the sand. That was a five, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, that was 05? Yeah, I was thinking. Actually, uh, no. You know what? I think I think the 05, they had the 20-some penalty game at Detroit. I always thought that's where Bart Scott threw the flag in the in the stands, but I think that's like burned in my head wrong because somebody somebody pointed it out recently on one of these one uh one that one play episodes, and, and it turned out it was in the Patriots Pats. game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Pats where they uh <clears throat> you know, where they had that tragic timeout um uh, yep. <laughs> that, that, that that changed the course of the game. But yeah, no, I mean I think I think uh, I, I, no, I was looking at all these guys, and I, I think that uh, Mosley and Orr is a really compelling, um, compelling one as well. Um, I guess my only thing was that it was a little bit short lived, and not that you know, not that uh, Roquan has been here all that long, but um, just looking at the sort of trajectory from you know the instant impact of his arrival and you know and Patrick Queen's ascension, um, I think you know regardless of which, which, which of these pairings you, you, you know, you go with, I think, you know, it's, it's a very exciting time uh, to uh, not, you know, worry that every single third down, uh, you know, a tight end is going to, you know, um, catch a pass over your middle linebacker. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, that's very true. And it's very important. I I'll even throw in one more just because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, feeling good about this. Ray Lewis and Jamie Sharper in 2001, in fact, for the latter part of 2000, so it's about the same, you know, season and a quarter or a little more. Sharper was coming off the field a lot, but he stopped doing it towards the end of 2000, 2001. He became a 32-dime player with Ray. And 
that defense was again really special. It held the team together while everything wrong was going wrong offensively with uh, uh, with Gerback at quarterback, right. and uh, and he was a hell of a player. It's a very tough loss in the expansion draft for the for the Ravens. Yeah, no, I mean that's it, we 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 have a great history um, at at middle linebacker, and it, I, I think it was very. I think that's what like kind of frustrated fans so much, you know, during, you know, the seasons. I mean, I think there was like a lot of excitement um, when it was going to be, uh, you know, uh, Patrick Owasso and, um, and Kenny Young, you know, they, they were looking really good. They were looking really fast. And then all of a sudden you figure out neither one of these guys really knows what, what, what they're doing um, at least to that response, you know, level of responsibility and having to rebuild, you know, that on the fly with Josh Bynes and LJ Fort, who were a big improvement, but by no means world beaters, you know, I mean, it was several years. I think that we were dealing with subpar middle linebacker play. Yeah. Well, if you, if you want to do it cheap, Bynes and Fort were an outstanding way to do it. And that's what the Ravens needed to do it in 2018, uh, 2019, right? Yeah. They yeah. built that, they rebuilt that defense on the fly, had one of the greatest offenses of all time, you know, on the, that they were handing the ball to. And the, the, the thing those guys undeniably brought to the game is the experience to read the quarterback and know what was going on behind them without having to turn their back completely and figure it out. So they didn't get, they didn't get pulled off by eye candy very often. Uh, they had good understanding of what their responsibilities were in pass coverage. And uh, they still weren't as good as what you get currently from um, these guys from Smith and Queen in terms of, of, of pass rush ability, which, I, I guess we haven't really talked about, but what they've, what those two have brought in terms of pass rush has been really special. Um, they're very good at <clears throat> disguising and using simulated pressure looks, oftentimes for just one of them, which is not, as I would call it, a true simulated pressure, but one guy's up at the line of scrimmage. And then sometimes he's coming, and oftentimes it's also a, a, just a one for one switcheroo there to try and confuse the gap for the offensive line and, and get their um, blocking assignments messed up. Yeah, they're both very capable um, uh, pass rushers. And, you know, something that I've noticed also is that when they're sort of running one-on-one, you know, you know, chasing the quarterback, they're very rarely is the quarterback able to sidestep them or shake them off. I mean, it's almost like they have the patience to make the quarterback commit and before they go for the for the kill. They've missed a lot of tackles on sacks so far this year from Mr. Almost and Ardarius Washington as well, I think had two. Might, one of them might have been the preseason. Don't, they don't, let's not quote me on that here. But they've had a lot of near misses uh, so far this year as well, which has been a, a bummer. Michael Pierce has also been a guy, guy applied tremendous pressure this year, but uh, uh, but has come up uh, short a couple times. Yeah, and, and like we like we say, you know, you know, how, the way that that squares with the fact that the Ravens have, I believe, the second most – sacks in the league maybe or, or fourth fourth most in, in, in the league you know they're pretty they're pretty high up there the way that that squares is that um uh they uh you know th- it's a lot of you know clean up sacks second man yep. you know to 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 the player and uh and you know i think um you know the, the this goes back to that element of team defense that we're talking about yeah just i i couldn't be more pleased with the way they're they're getting after the quarterback and the, and the compound pressures uh, really have worked out as a as a thing. The 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 comment is always there that well it's not going to work against the better teams or better opponents and better times and playoffs and blah 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 blah. Well, it's working for now. Just give it a shot. I mean, literally everything is working about this defense right now. They've allowed three point seven five yards per play. So before you project your expectations of just how bad this defense could be. It's true. Some team could figure out how to exploit what's going on now with the Ravens defense. Um, try try and appreciate what's really going on for what it is and then see where the holes are from that. But don't don't start with, you know, these guys suck and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not true. I mean, even though they haven't got a lot of pressure from edge, they have tremendous team sack rate that is built upon having a, a highly integrated defensive scheme um, that, that just looks really good right now. And they're facing a couple more opponents these next couple of weeks, starting with with um, uh, you know either Pickett or Trubisky, and then Tannehill, uh, who who I think the scheme ought to work against as well. And by the way, if you want to throw deep on the Baltimore Ravens right now, I freaking double dare you. I dare you. 
with with them in cover two the whole time. Joe Burrow wouldn't take him up on it, and we did. He failed. 0 for 7, one interception, 0.0 passer rating. Um, they haven't given up a whole bunch of big plays this year. In fact, the 37-yard DPI, I believe, is the longest uh, play they've allowed this year. Yeah, it's it's funny. The people who are projecting this like defensive fall off never, you know, never bothered to project that the offense is going to be facing defenses that are, you know, not nearly as good as the ones we've been facing or will be facing, you know, this week. You know, you're, we just went up against two of the better defensive lines in the league. Some would say mm-hmm. Cleveland is the best, and you know, you have Gus Edwards, you know, standing up Miles Garrett on a pass rush, you know, mm-hmm. com- you know, and stonewalling him, and you know, I. I it, the season's a long, long thing. And, you know, there are going to be ups and downs. You can only play who's on your schedule. And so far, you know, the Ravens have answered the call. And, you know, all I can say to the fans is, you know, enjoy Patrick Queen and Roquan while you can. Because, uh, you know, uh, if I had if I had to bet, they won't be together next year. Yeah, well, I would have to agree with that. And Patrick Queen's going to get a big contract. He's going to really deserve it. And we need to be not only happy for him, we need to hope he proves out to earn that big contract the rest of this year. Uh, other teams will be looking for him to finish well, of course. Other teams will be looking for him to play as well as he has through four games through 17. Um, but uh, he's in great position to make a lot of money, and the Ravens will get a little bit better compensatory pick from him. And I uh, hope he goes to the NFC is all I can say. Absolutely. Looking forward to um, having having some more draft picks. All right, always a pleasure to do this with this show with you, Slava. Tell folks where they can talk football with you online. I'm on Twitter at Slava Cooperstein. That's S-L-A-V-A-K-U-P-E-R-S-T-E-I-N. Outstanding. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. Uh, DMs are always open on Twitter. Always mm-hmm. looking for a kernel of a show idea that we can do together. I uh, have a, a, a little bit of a call to, to, with a three people, two of whom want to debate something. And this is an interesting thing I've never tried before. But I'd be interested in moderating debate. If you have a friend who has a, a difference of opinion with you on a particular Ravens scheme or analysis uh, topic, I'd be happy to host that for you. Uh, anyway, uh, lots of fun. I'll get back to you very quickly on that. Uh, for for Slava Cooperstein, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye. We'll talk to you next week on One Last Thing.